Welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast Network. Our purpose and passion is to highlight a nonprofit organization in each episode, giving that organization an opportunity to tell their story in their words to better inform and educate the respective communities they serve, as well as provide one more tool for them to share their message to constituents and donors. Hi, I'm Jeff Holden, Principal of Multipoint Content Strategies and Hear Me Now Studio. We provide this forum pro bono to help build stronger communities through shared voices and to both encourage and support the growth of local nonprofit organizations through podcasting. My guest today is an incredible individual having accomplished much in his 41 years. He now returns to our community and his alma mater as the youngest person ever to lead the university, our anchor university, Sacramento State. He earned a bachelor's and master's degree at Sac State, then a master's of education and doctorate in educational leadership and policy studies at Arizona State. He served as a professor and administrator, including vice president for student affairs and campus diversity at San Diego State before becoming Sac State president. He has authored 16 books and published significant research focusing on racial inequality issues in education. His story is as remarkable as his accomplishments, and I'm honored to have President Luke Wood, Dr. Luke Wood, as my guest today. Dr. Wood, welcome to the Nonprofit Podcast Network. We are so excited to have you here today. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the, the invitation. You know, one thing I'd like to clarify for our listeners, and they may be wondering, why is someone from Sac State on the Nonprofit Podcast Network? And what people don't really realize is that the university is one of our largest nonprofit organizations. It's responsible for a significant amount of employment, the students it serves, as well as the educators and staff it employs. And it creates one of our most diverse ecosystems in Sacramento. And you're responsible for its well-being. I'm one of the, the many people responsible, but yes, I, I have the, the privilege of serving as the chief steward. You know, your story is most unique. Would you walk us through the journey that brought you back to Sac State? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I should begin by saying that I had the privilege of going to Sacramento State as a student. So um, like our students here, I took classes here. I walked the hallways here. I was in part of clubs and organizations. So uh, I hail from far Northern California from a small town called McLeod. It's about 1600 people uh, nestled at the base of Mount Shasta. Uh, surrounding cities, if folks have never heard of McLeod or uh, Mount Shasta, Weed, Dunsmuir, Wairica, Etna. And so it's, it's a small area. And so coming to Sacramento State was a really an eye-opening experience to go from um, a small town to what to me was the, the big city. Um, and being here for both my, my bachelor's degree and my master's degree, it was just a, a, a an eye-opening experience. And there's things from that experience that have directly shaped how I think about what it means to be a president and the role that I have and the responsibility that I have in this role. So um, for example, um, I was born while my, my mother was in prison. So I immediately became a ward of the court and was in the foster care system and grew up in a large foster home in, in, Mount, in Mount Shasta McLeod area, um, 14 brothers and sisters. The home had over 350 children uh, who went through that home. And then across the street from us was a group home. So a foster home, a group home. And fortunately, um, unlike many people in the system, I did have the the opportunity to be adopted in that home. And so I was fostered in that home and then later adopted in that home. And so many of us were either a foster, adopt, long-term care, guardianship. And so um, it was that was in and of itself a, a very unique experience that I, I don't think that many people can understand. And so coming to, to Sacramento State, um, I came here having had that background and having had some of the, the challenges that can be associated with uh, with that background, and then becoming a student here in an environment that I immediately fell in love with. So if you've ever been to far Northern California, there's there's it's basically the forest, right? And so you come to Sacramento mm -hmm. State and you walk on our campus and it's like a park-like environment. There's there's trees and, and, and wildlife and just, it's an amazing, beautiful campus. 
And I immediately felt, felt like I was at home. And so that part of it to me was, was really powerful, um, being uh, really close to the state capitol, uh, the diversity of students that were here. It just, it was immediately that I just fell in love with Sacramento State. But being a student with that background, I also had um, a lot of, ex uh, of challenging experiences. You know, I was a first generation college student. I was, you know, a former foster child. I struggled with food and housing insecurities. So I remember um, about um, the end of my my freshman year, I'd, I'd done pretty well my, my first uh, two semesters. And at the end of that that freshman year, um, my my father became in, incarcerated and he ended up later um, uh, passing away in, pr in prison. But throughout most of my experience while I was a student here, actually throughout all of my experience um, when I was a student here, it was managing trying to stay focused in school while dealing with extreme life pressures. So um, it used to be that I could, you know, for example, call home if I, I needed, you know, 10, $20 to go get something to eat. And I went from having that to having no support. So some days I go two days, sometimes three days at a time without eating. And I would scrounge up change off the ground. And there's a, a local Taco Bell that's not very far from campus, it's still there. And uh, you could get a bean burrito and a cup of water for 69 cents. And so I would scrounge up change and I would go there, especially after a couple of days when I would when I would get really, really hungry. And and that would be the way that I would sustain myself. So if there was a campus event that had food at it, I was there. So there was I mean, I also say this. I ate a lot of pizza at a lot of campus events. <laughs> And I learned about all sorts of things that I didn't really care about because I needed to go and get something to eat and they were serving food at some of the events. Um, but it was even more than that because I also struggled with with housing insecurity. So I would go um, and live in, in uh, my car, live in uh, my brother's garage, um, and just I had really unstable living situations. My identical twin brother, he went to school here and the year that he was student body president, he was homeless. And he was living in his office on campus. And so I, I think about that experience with that just in, incredible challenge. And then I think about uh, the experiences that many of our, our, our foster youth or former foster youth have with just being system impacted in, in the ways in that, which that um, is very difficult. And then, of course, dealing with um, you know the loss of our, our, our father going to prison and, and eventually again, passing away in prison and, and visiting him throughout the time that I was that I was in in college it was a pretty challenging experience and then in the midst of all that challenge I I found my biological mother and mm. that in and of itself is a I think is an interesting story so essentially I had tried to to find find her throughout you know throughout my life and it sure. was during college that um, and as a close, I had a, you know, I was put into foster care. She had us, as I mentioned, when she was in prison, she struggled mightily with mental health, mightily with, with, um, drug addiction. And she had multiple opportunities to come and take custody of my brother and I, and just never did. And all, all, uh, four of her children were either taken away or were in foster care or adopted or in some way impacted by the system. And, and so I had always still wanted to, to know who, who is this, this, this individual. And one of the things that I think a lot of, uh, of people who are um, placed into foster care, particularly those who are, who that happens at birth, there's this sense of like rejection who, and, and, and this was my, my thinking back then, who gives away their own, their child. And I couldn't understand that. I don't understand it now, but back then as a, as a young man, I couldn't. And so what would happen is I would like do searches online, try to find information, uh, uh, yellow books, um, national search services, couldn't find her. And then I basically was working in student government. I was making 80 bucks a month, which isn't a lot, but I was living off of that. And I managed to save up $150 to hire a, a private investigator who found her in one day, in one day. Amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So what happened 
is um, I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna go meet her, and she was uh, in the in the living in the Tenderloin in in San Francisco. I had an address and not a good phone number, but I knew where she was. And so me and my 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 girlfriend now wife hopped in my my car, uh, this beater car that I had that didn't have a uh, it was a stick shift and it didn't have second gear, so you had to get fast <laughs> enough in first gear to get the third. And made our way uh, down to, to, to San Francisco, um, into the Tenderloin, into what was a really, it's a very a scary area, particularly back then. Um, you know, obviously, they struggle with a high in house population, high levels of, of drugs and other illicit um, activities. And, she, and I pulled up to this, um, this very scary looking building that I knew she was she was living in. And the only thing I can describe it as is if anybody ever used to watch NYPD Blue back in the day, you remember like when they would the police would go into those those like really dark crack houses. And that and that's what it looked like. I mean I walked inside, there's holes in the wall, bags hanging out out of the holes in the wall. It was it was scary. And so I walked down this long hall and I knocked on the door. And I remember for the seeing her for the first time, she opened the door and I said, hi, my name is Luke. I'm your son. And I don't know what I had in my mind that the experience was going to be. I didn't know if I, if I thought it was going to be uh, her embracing me and telling me how happy she was to see. I don't know what I had in my mind. I don't know if I had expectations, but it certainly wasn't what happened, which is that she let out this blood curdling scream at the top of her lungs and slammed the door shut in my face. And it was so scary and so off putting that uh, my girlfriend, now wife and I ran down the hall as fast as we could because we thought she was coming out with a gun to kill us. Mm. It was absolutely terrifying. And so we make our way back down to the first floor outside, you know, bit like, Oh my gosh, that was crazy. And, and it was, it it was one of the most important moments in my life. I felt like a physical weight was lifted off my shoulders. I, it it is imagine like that horrible experience, but then the, the feeling itself was almost euphoric in that for the first time I felt like I understood why she had given us up. She could not have taken care of us. And Mm -hmm. I didn't blame her anymore. And it made me feel just different about about life. And so I go back to to, the Sacramento State, you know, back in classes. And a few months later, I'm like, you know what, I've got to go try to see her again. And so this is all happening while I'm I'm struggling in school and having all these experiences. And I and I make my way back down there again to go see her a second time. So get into walk up the stairs in this in this scary building, walk down the hall. And I remember knocking on the door um, again. So I knocked on the door and I was expecting, like, I, I didn't say, I, I don't want to say I had running shoes on, but I was expecting it to be, you know, kind of similar to the first time and it was different. She opened the door, cracked it open. And I remember her looking at me and I got a clear, much clearer look at her then. And I was like, I immediately saw my face in her face. And I said, hi, my name is Luke. I'm your son. And she looks at me and she goes and really close. And she says, I thought you were. And then just closes the door, doesn't slam it, doesn't scream. And I was like, oh, well, that was more positive than last time. <laughs> so uh, I had a, a, a pad of paper with me and I ripped off a piece of paper about this size and I wrote on it and I wrote, do I have any siblings? And I slipped it underneath the door. And then I heard some rummaging around for a few moments. And then the paper was slipped back underneath the door. And it said, yes. And I was like, okay, if I'm going to get information from her, I better ask uh, questions that can't be answered in a yes or no. (laughs) So the next question I asked was, um, what are their names and where were they born? Because I was going to try to find them. Because I'm trying to find not just her, but my siblings. And so... I slipped that back underneath the door and it takes a few more moments. And a few more more moments after that, she slipped it back under with some names and some hospitals that she thinks they're born, born at. In reality, none of the information was accurate, but I think it's what she thought was accurate. 
Um, mm-hmm. For example, names that she named people that weren't actually ended up being their legal names. So for example, my name that she gave me is Ariel, but my name is Jonathan Luke Wood. So um, the name that I was given by her wasn't the name that I ended up having, if that makes sense. Yes. So we go back and forth a few times. And, and after that, I slip it underneath the door one more time, kind of partially under the door. She never pulled it back, never responded. And so I take that slip of paper with me. I have it somewhere. And that was the only positive interaction that I ever had with her. And so, um, but it was meaningful to me because I felt like she was trying to convey a sense of care. She was trying to be supportive, but she just didn't have the capacity to do so. So there was only one last time that I, that I ever got a chance to engage with her. It was about a year later. Um, now, during that year, it was a really tough year at school at Sac State because I had to kind of have um, a reckoning with where I was academically. Um, I was mm-hmm. I had 11 incompletes on my transcripts because I wasn't really focused in school. I was very involved on campus and student government clubs and organizations. But what I derived um, in terms of learning was primarily taking place outside the classroom. And I wasn't as serious as I should have been. And during that time frame, I got far more serious about school. I started, you know, uh, completing those incomplete grades. I started taking classes and really just being focused in school. And and so I'm, I go back to see her a different Luke than I was the first two times that I, that I went. I wasn't um, in a, in a, an emotional up and down roller coaster wreck. I was somebody who was more focused on their future. And so I, I travel back down in, the, in, this, in that same beater car and go see her. And I walk up to, into, the second, you know, into the second floor and I knock on the door and there was no response. And so... At first, I was dismayed because, you know, uh, it's not like I had a lot of money for gas to be able to make it there and back. And so I was disappointed. But it was early enough in the day where I said, I'm going to give it an hour or two and come back. And so I went outside in the in the area, in the Tenderloin. And there's lots of folks on the, on, on the street, you know, who are part of the unhoused community. And I'm asking them, does anybody know who she is? And go through a few people. And then finally, I find somebody who knows who she is, who knows exactly who she is. And he says, oh, yeah, you mean the bag lady. And I said, the bag Hmm. lady? I was like, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, you know, um, she's really smart. Every day in the morning, she goes to the law library and she gets a bag and she fills it with books and she brings it back to where she stays and she reads books throughout the entire day, the entire night. And then she goes back and repeats the same thing the next day. And I knew that she was intelligent. I knew that at one point in time, she had been at least a lecturer at San Francisco State. I knew that she likely had a a PhD in psychology, Um, but I didn't know um, that she was still committed to her own learning and growth and development, despite the incredible uh, challenges she had with drugs and mental health. And so Mm -hmm. having that, I go back to the uh, having heard that was very powerful, empowering. I go back to the uh, apartment complex where she's at or the, the 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 hotel, motel, whatever it was. I knock on the door one more time. And she opens the door and I try to reintroduce myself. And I see that she's coughing. She has like blood coming out of her mouth. She slams the door in my face. So scary again, run down the hall. It was like very much just like the first time. And that was the last time uh, that I ever saw her. She mm. she died. Um, she died in January of 2010, and I got my PhD in February of that year. But was really interesting about it is my father, who had been in, in prison, he um, he had he had he was struggling with Alzheimer's and dementia. And he ended up passing away. So I'm managing all this while I'm in my doctoral program. And so I fly home because my father passes away, right? So the very day that he passes away, I I land in Sacramento. I go, I'm talking with my mother. I'm trying to console her, trying to support her. It was just a very tough day. And then Mm -hmm. the phone rings for me. 
at my at my mother's house in Sacramento. I'm like, okay, that's a that's an odd thing. Why would I be? Get, I live in Arizona. I'm going to Arizona State to get my PhD. Why would why would there be a phone call here? And so um, she said, "So Lucas, the phone for you." I said, "Okay, all right." So I I pick up the phone, and a person on the other line is like, "Hi, my name is so and so, and I'm the coroner in San Francisco, and I'm mm. calling to let you know that your mother has died." On the same day that my father passed away, and. I was and I I was a, a very emotionally numb at that at that point anyhow and she says and in the corner I asked the, uh, him a question I said well how did she die right it's a normal question to want to know and he said well she died of a heart attack coming out of the law library on the steps of the law library with a bag full of books and so I don't um, and so part of the reason. And I tell all those, that, those different backgrounds for a reason. Part of the reason that I do what I do is because in all of our students, I see different parts of my own journey. I, I'm committed to our students who have been uh, foster youth and have experienced that system of wards of the court. Uh, I'm, I'm committed to issues around basic needs for students who experience food and housing insecurity, who don't know where their next meal is going to come from, who don't know where they're going to lay their head at night. I'm committed to those who have either themselves been incarcerated or have close family members who've been part of their support and part of their journey. And so a lot of the things that I'm focused on right now as, as a president are based upon the personal experiences that I had as a student here at Sacramento State, because I know what our students need to get across that stage. And I don't want us to be at yet another institution that gives false promises to the communities that are in the most need of support. That story is in its totality. I've heard bits and pieces at various things that you've spoken at, but I've never heard it, heard it all in a continuous, contiguous run as you just told it. So thank you for that. It, it is quite amazing and quite moving. You go to Arizona State, you end up in San Diego, an opportunity presents itself to come back to Sacramento State. And you've said all along that you felt this connection that you would be back at Sac yeah. State, even as president. Yeah. What was it that you think drew you to not only that purpose, but to the conclusion that you're here now? Well, you know, I, I began in student government very early on. I had been in student government in, in my small high school, um, been st was student body president there. And so I've always had this idea of, of wanting to help support others. It's always just been ingrained within me. Um, you know, was in Boy Scouts and Eagle Scouts. So I just I'll, always have this, this desire to want to help support others. And I, mm -hmm. I remember going off to Sacramento State and I was started in this program called EOP, Educational Opportunity Program. It's a program that provides support for students who are first in their in their families to go to college and low income. And I remember in the, the first session, then they used to say this back in the day, and I think they used to think it was motivational, but it wasn't. <laughs> uh, my how things have changed. But they used to be have us all in the room and they say, look to your left, look to your right. Only one of you will graduate. And, and I, I, and the idea that they were trying to say was you got to work really hard. It's not just guaranteed that you're if going to college, you're going to graduate, but it was like the worst possible message to get there. Agreed. Right. Um, and so to me that that was actually an eye opening, startling experience because every uh, throughout my whole life, it, it had just been the conversation about, you got to go to college, you got to go to college, you got to go to college. But I'd never imagined this idea that, well, wait, people go to college and then they don't finish. To me, that was just mind blowing. I never, I didn't have a, mm -hmm. a framework to understand that. And then finding out that it's not just everyone, but there's certain communities, low income students, first generation students, students of color, uh, particularly uh, Native American and Black and African American students, that there's challenges that they experience that don't lead them to to walking across that stage at, at graduation. And so early on, uh, I became really passionate 
um, um, with this notion that we have to create an environment where every single student has that opportunity to walk across the stage. And so um, my sophomore year, by the time I was in my sophomore year, I was an elected position student government. And anybody who knows me, you can go out and find 100 people who will tell you this. They will tell you that I was obnoxious in telling them that I'm going to be the president of Sacramento State. Um, and it wasn't for the sake of the title but for the sake of the impact about what it could, what we could do to provide more support to students, to increase graduation rates, increase employability, to increase median earnings after graduation, and to just create an experience where students have more dignity. And I was, I was passionate about it. I was uh, solely focused on it. Even in my sophomore year of college, I, I created a retention program with some friends where we, we, we had uh, 30 students and we had a, a coordinated effort where we provided mentoring for them on a weekly basis. We had a, a triage process, case management approach, assessment. Like nobody's doing that as, an, as a, a general college student, but I was just so passionate about it that even early on um, that that's what I was dedicated to and, and, and focused on. And so it had always been my goal throughout my entire life to be in this role. Um, you know, I am a, a religious person. I do believe that I was meant to be in this role and that it is, is part of my purpose in this life at this time in this season for Sacramento State for me to be um, at the helm and helping to move forward these efforts. And so throughout my whole life, I worked to reach this moment. And I, I was fortunate that I was able to do things on an accelerated timeline that's faster than what most people could do, but probably because I had a focus on what the outcome was going to be. So I became mm -hmm. an assistant professor and I got uh, received tenure in four years. I became an associate um, and, a, and a, a tenure and associate professor. I, within three years, was a full professor. Within a year of that, was the first black distinguished professor in SDSU's history, San Diego State's history. I, for within a few years after that, I was vice president for student affairs and campus diversity and held that role for, for several years and did some really good work at, at San Diego State with some amazing colleagues. And, and at every moment, the goal was eventually to be here. What I will say that was different than what I expected is I did not expect to be here at this moment because I did, uh, because Robert Nelson, the president who came before me, I think did a, just really a, a marvelous job with this campus. And I, I was a, a alumni would show up to you know football games here and there, and just was just proud of the work that he was doing, and looked was looking forward to seeing him continue to do that great work. Mm -hmm. And so his announcement that he was um, retiring uh, was a surprise to me, uh, not because he didn't deserve to retire, but because many of us didn't want him to. <laughs> but um, but then when he announced that he was going to retire, I immediately knew that that I had to put my hat forward for this role. And it's it's hard to explain, but the minute that I submitted my application for this role, I knew that it was that I was going to be selected. It wasn't out of arrogance. But it was just out, out of what I believe is divine purpose. Mm -hmm. Words I was going to use. It's just it, it's it's divinity at work, fate, yeah. and it certainly gives credence to the fact that once you have a goal and a purpose and focus on it, you accomplish it. Yeah. And you hear so many kids who say, "I want to be an astronaut." They become astronauts. I want to be president of a company or whatever it is they choose to do. A doctor, you know, a lawyer. They focus on that and they become it. It's a little bit more difficult and challenging in a state organization, which I applaud you on because that's an incredible accomplishment, especially, you know, at a younger age. So, you know, kudos to you. And the faith-based element, I don't think can be negated, you know, for many of us at yeah. least. Yeah. I mean, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to move a little bit forward. Yeah. You're a scholar of racial equity, yes. and yeah. 
Equity is frequently spoken about at the university at all levels, as it is in the state and federal and, and every place we turn today. Would you explain what that means to a parent considering sending their child to Sac State? And then subsequently what it means to a student considering the university as well? Yeah. So first let me say what equity is in terms of how we think about it. Equity means that we recognize that there are some groups that have historically experienced uh, marginalization due to systems that um, have not produced the same outcomes for them as their peers. And as a result, we have to be more intentional to have a heightened focus on those students to make sure that they have an equivalent opportunity to be successful. So mm-hmm. think about it um, like this. If you have a building that's on fire, do you go and spray water on the whole building or the place in the building that's on fire, <laughs> right? You start out where the fire's at, right? As opposed to just spraying water all over the building. And that's essentially what we do. It doesn't mean that we're not focused on the whole building, but we're focused on the area that is in the need of the most attention at that moment. And so what equity to me means is that we have this heightened focus and we have to create programs and services for our our students of color, our black students, our Latinx students, our Native American students, our Southeast Asian students, Hmong, Cambodian, Laotian, Vietnamese, our first generation students, our low income students, our undocumented students, students who have experiences that based upon extensive data show that they experience what's called disproportionate impact. Disproportionate Mm -hmm. impact is a a term which means that they essentially have outcomes that are lower than that of their peers. And we don't believe that those outcomes are lower because of the students, because of their families or their communities. We don't use the they statements and say they're lazy, they don't care, they're not really here for school. Instead, we look into the mirror and we say, what is it that we are doing or we are not doing that's resulting in the outcome disparities that we see? So it's looking into the mirror to see our own frailties as educators and as an institution, rather than looking out the window and blaming somebody else for something that our research has extensively shown is more a function of the systems themselves. And so what we're trying to build here at Sacramento State are systems that specifically support those minoritized students, com- com- minoritized student communities. So we're working on a basic needs center where we're bringing in um, our, a food pantry, clothing closet, um, crisis manage, uh, crisis counselors to all be in one area so that when students are experiencing what Luke Wood did, not being able to know mm-hmm. where their next meal is going to come from, they've got a place to go. We're um, building up programs like our program called Project Rebound, which is for students who've been justice impacted or formerly incarcerated, so that when they come to a place like Sacramento State, they're getting academic advising, they're getting counseling, they're getting support services to reduce the likelihood of recidivism, and even more importantly, to set them on the path to create a better life for themselves and for their families. And so we've just set aside a a beautiful space here in Sacramento Hall, here in the the halls of the administration, so that they can have a center that that provides them with the dignity that they deserve for being on a journey to create that better life. Uh, Another example of that is what we're doing for our Black and African American students. Uh, We are, are essentially realigning our resources right now to create what we believe will be the first black honors college in the nation where students are going to be able to come in and it's an institution within the institution that provides them with counseling, mentorship, specialized lectures, specialized classrooms to provide them with the highest level of service so that we know that, again, they'll have that opportunity to walk across the stage. Because one of the things that we've seen with Sacramento State is an increase in graduation rates. Under President Nelson, it went from an 8.5% graduation rate to a 28.5% graduation rate, just an an incredible uh, increase. And and I'm so grateful for him for all the hard work that he and the faculty and staff did to get there. And yet, even with that essentially 30% four-year graduation rate, it's only 10.5% for Black males. So we have 
we're at the bottom quarter when it comes to success for our black students, yet we have the highest population of black students in the entire Cal State system. We are the number one black serving institution in the Cal State out of all 23 institutions. So for me, we have a, a moral responsibility because right now our graduation rates say that we're ground zero for what's wrong with higher education. And come mm-hmm. fall of next year, you're gonna see that we're no longer the problem, but we're the solution for the future. And we expect that colleges and universities across the country will follow. You've got this experiential equity that very few presidents, if any, have of universities to where you can literally relate to what the students are going through. So the programs that you're instituting are extremely relative because you've experienced them and you understand. How has that manifested itself in your relationship with the students on campus? I mean, engaging with the students is unquestionably the most enjoyable part of this job. Um, They give me so much inspiration. I do feel like we have a unique connection. Um, I, I, I talk about my background and, and my experience, right, with being a you know a former foster child, uh, system mm-hmm. impacted in terms of dealing with the criminal justice system, um, being you know dealing with food and housing insecurities. And let me just say, I don't actually enjoy talking about those things. I do so so that the students know that there's somebody here who understands and who cares. And I got to say, I've seen that directly translate into how the students engage me. And they and I got to say, students will regularly tell me that, you know what? I saw the thing about um, you saying that, you know, you were sleeping in your car. I just wanted you to know that I'm sleeping in my car right now. And that hearing your story makes me feel like if you could do it, I can do it too. And there, I got to say, there's nothing that gives you more motivation than that. And at the same time, I don't want to have those students sleeping in their cars, right? So, <laughs> like, I want to serve as as um, as a source of inspiration to them, but I also then also want to be part of the solution in creating systems that prevent them from having those same experiences. And the ability for them to share that situation, whereas before, who would they have shared that with? It was an embarrassment. Now they've got somebody who's not only experienced it, but they can talk to. Yeah, who's more like them than, you know, others. Yeah, let's absolutely. And I do think back to what you said, it does, it does, it deals too with being a scholar of this area. I've Mm -hmm. spent my entire career researching what does it take to support students who come from my background? And so what I had the privilege of doing in this role is taking what I've learned as a scholar and putting it into practice as a president. And I would imagine that's not too often that you have the ability for somebody who not only has as experienced, but is now a scholar to those same situations coming together and being able to be implemented on campus with the students. And what a remarkable opportunity for everybody involved. Let's shift gears a little bit more to uh, uh, athletics. Okay. You know, I've heard you address the significance of the athletic program to the school, and we know a winning football team is really a key factor at any university. Congratulations. Yeah, we've got a great team. <laughs> but a little bit differently, athletics is just not about the football team. Would you explain? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and of course, I say that with my background being on this side, <laughs> a football helmet <laughs> and a, a football. But um, I see it back there. But let me just say, um, athletics to me, has to be athletics for the common student. Every single student can benefit from athletics. And what I mean by that is in a university, you have intramural sports where students compete against one another in football, basketball, soccer on campus, your average daily student. And what's good about that is that we have seen that post pandemic, many more of our students struggle with depression, with anxiety, with stress. And research has routinely shown that exercise on on a regular basis can help alleviate some of those pressures. 
And what's even more important, thinking about that racial equity lens, is we know that that stress, depression, anxiety has an even more adverse impact on our minoritized students. So it's mm -hmm. athletics for the common student for the sake of what it can do for student success. And I think that that's what uh, is a delineator for us. So we've got intramural sports. We have recreation sports where students uh, uh, compete individually, um, not necessarily fully affiliated with the institution, but they're students here. We have club sports where we have teams that compete against other teams at other institutions. And then we also have intercollegiate athletics. So for me, it's about an investment in athletics across the board, intramural sports, club sports, rec sports, inter intervarsity sports, to create that opportunity for every student to have an experience with personal development, leadership development, to increase their confidence, to have a healthy lifestyle, because we know that those things can directly translate to more effective students in the classroom and a better ability to manage uh, the difficulties of being a student in the common era. Not to mention the greater leadership and and greater roles in their communities. Yeah. And, and and I applaud you for that. I'm a big fan of of holistic health. So it's you know it's mind, body, spirit. Yeah. And in many cases that doesn't happen. Yeah. Let me let me add something know, to that. Which, something you can't see on the screen here. <laughs> but I also got these in my office too. <laughs> I love and, it. Is that for when you're coming in for budget negotiations? You know, they're, they're great for budget negotiations as well. <laughs> but um, I should say that um, sports is, an, is, an, is important for our students, but I also think it's important for our faculty, our staff, and our, our admin too. So um, for example, boxing is part of my personal life. Um, I a, am an amateur boxer. Um, I've done... Uh, several bouts in the past few years. I train pretty much every day. I try to spar uh, every weekend. And mm -hmm. I do so because uh, when I was an administrator several years ago, I was really starting to struggle with enhanced, enhanced stress associated with the job. And I needed an outlet uh, to basically live, really just be able to live a better lifestyle. And there's a going to kind of work on racial equity. There's a scholar named William Smith, not Will Smith, the actor, <laughs> but William Smith, mm -hmm. he's out of the University of Utah, and he's got a, a concept called racial battle fatigue. And racial battle fatigue says that when you're in an environment with persistent racial stress and strain, that it impacts you in three different ways. First, cognitively, your ability to process information, retain information, and your focus. Second, psychologically, constant anxiety and worrying, anger, anger, suppression, resentment, and physiologically, so physically. So, um, so dealing with the inability to be able to sleep, dealing with ulcers, dealing with other health conditions that are all part of this racialized stress. And the reason it's called racial battle fatigue is that his research has been able to show that the impacts of being in an environment where racism is present are similar to the impacts of, of, of those who have been in conflict zones or in wars, those who are in armed forces in terms of what's called combat stress syndrome. And the connection mm. point is that when you're in an environment with persistent stress and strain, that it impacts your body in those three different ways. And so several years ago, I picked up boxing really just to lose weight. And then, then was in the gym and saw some guys, you know, sparring in the, in the thing. I was like, well, I want to try that. And it just, it just manifested into something totally different. So when I talk about the importance of sports for the common student, it's also because the, this was good for Luke Wood too. And I learned mm -hmm. that um, I'm a better person. I'm a better husband, a better father, a better administrator, a better leader when I'm engaged in being healthy and taking care of myself. And so boxing is one of the ways that I do that personally as well. Well, so if you don't gain the respect by the title of president or doctor, you're going to get it as a result of the fact that you're a boxer. <laughs> yeah. Said differently, the president's got hands, but you know. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So a two-part question expectations and gauge of success. 
If you were to give us a couple of the highest priorities you've got before we conclude, what would they be and what does it look like when you know you're there? So the highest priority always is going to be student success. Now, for me, that means graduation rates plus students mm -hmm. graduating with the ability to have a job and their median earnings, say, three years after graduation. That's what I mean when I say student success. So that's always has to be our North Star, what guides every single thing that we do. Um, so how we'll know that all of these different efforts that we put into place are successful is whether or not we increase graduation rates and, and those other markers of success and we reduce equity gaps or that disproportionate impact between students and their peers. Some of the ways that we're trying to get there are around this, this Black Honors College, which we believe, mm -hmm. again, will be the first in the country. And we look forward to creating a system of Black Honors Colleges across the country that serve as, as the, the new wave of, of efforts to support uh, Black and African-American students akin to what the HBCUs uh, represented historically and continue to represent for uh, those who are part of those uh, those institutions. The second thing that we're focused on is residential education and living. What I mean by that is what people call dorms. <laughs> Like we need to mm -hmm. have more uh, residential living opportunities for our students. I want to be able to get to a point where every single one of our first and second year students knows where they're going to lay their head at night and where their next meal is coming from. And I know that we can get there. We've got some really creative partnerships that we're be engaging in that we'll be able to talk about hopefully in the coming months. They're going to help us get to a better point around that. But it's very important that we have residential learning. And that residential learning, we've been able to look at our data and see that when a student lives on campus, their graduation rate is more like 40% in four years, not 30%. So it's a big difference. And the reason for that is because they don't go home per se. They go home to academic advising, to tutoring, to supplemental instruction, to a residence hall advisor, to all this programming that further develops them. So they're always learning. They're always growing. And I think that that's... Mm -hmm another thing that is important for us. And then I would say that the last thing that I would say that is a, a marquee thing that we're really focused on is what's called the California Mobility Center. And essentially, essentially um, CARB has established standards that move us away from gas vehicles to electric and autonomous vehicles at a very rapid pace. But the ability to for the state and the country really to be able to get to where we need to be in terms of creating a better physical climate in terms of um, global warming and, and some of the other major concerns of our time is going to require us to accelerate um, the, the industry around these areas. And so we're building the California Mobility Center. It's in partnership with the Greater Sacramento Economic Council, with SMUD, with UC Davis, with the city of Sacramento, we've got 25 acres just right off of, of, of campus that we've set aside. And we're going to create the number one place in the United States where intellectuals and industry come together to create advances that helps to promote a better climate, to promote technology. And we're going to use it to build the marquee in, uh, engineering school in the state. And what a great statement, not only for the engineering school and for the university, but for the entire city of Sacramento. You know, we, we talk about the university as an anchor university, and what does that really mean? I think those are the kinds of things that it means. It's that statement we get to make by the accomplishments and the things that we do and the education we provide. Yeah. So one, one last question. Yeah. You yeah. have got so much on your plate you have so many things going on. What do you do to relax? Besides boxing for exercise, that is not relaxing in my mind. <laughs> well, I would have said boxing had you not said that. But <laughs> uh, what do I do to relax? Uh, so I I am a still I still consider myself a musician. Uh, when I was in, in school here, uh, my brother and I had a, a band that was actually pretty well known that we did pretty good. And in fact, uh, we almost got signed by a record label. Um, but that ended up not happening and ended up being on a different path. So what I do is I play a little guitar. I play a little bit, bit of piano. 
So there's actually in Sacramento Hall uh, downstairs, President Donald Girth, who was actually the first president that uh, was here when I was a student, um, him and his uh-huh. wife left a, um, a donated a piano to Sacramento State. So in between meetings, you'll hear the halls of Sacramento Hall uh, filled with uh, someone clunking their way through some old, some piano songs that they remember, and also every now and then writing something new. And so um, I don't get a lot of time to do it, but I would say that probably in an average day, I spend 15 minutes on it, kind of spread throughout different meetings or in between different meetings, just to give me a chance to, to recenter. And then I think the other thing that I would say is, is, is spending time with my family. Um, I got three great kids, an amazing wife, and and a pesky little dog. And so um, that's what gives me joy. That's what reminds me of why I'm here. And it's what holds me accountable to create the best possible Sacramento State because I'm doing it for the students who are here, but I'm also doing it so that someday when my children go to school here, and they don't have a choice, they're going to go to school here. <laughs> I told them, you, can, you can major in whatever you want to do and be whatever you want to be, as long as that's at Sacramento State. But I want it to be the Sacramento State that they deserve. And that mm-hmm. isn't necessarily the Sacramento State that I had, but it's the Sacramento State that they're going to inherit. And I would be remiss if I did not ask. It's it's Luke and Josh Wood headlining the band. Name was what? It was Free State. F-R-E-E-S-T-8. I love it. Yeah. Well, President Wood, Dr. Wood, Luke, welcome home. You know, as you've commented, the longer duration, 10 years of the presidency at Sac State, you know, I, I really hope yours is right up there with the longest. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the opportunity, the invitation, and looking forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Nonprofit Podcast Series. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If what you heard moved you, please reach out to that organization and do what you can to help. If you like and appreciate what we're doing to support local nonprofits, please give us a positive review, subscribe, and share. If you're a nonprofit with an interest in participating in an episode, you can reach us at info at multipointstrategies.com. The Nonprofit Podcast Network is a production of Multipoint Content Strategies and is recorded and edited by Hear Me Now Studio.